over. Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again open Judges chapter 14, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and to impart to us wisdom so that we may more correctly understand the different symbols that are being presented before us and their relation to that which we need to understand for today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you now to ask for your blessing, to ask for your guidance as we open your word. Help us now, Father, for there are many items within this chapter that are as yet not clear for us. We ask, Father, for your spirit. Help us, may your spirit help us and guide us through this chapter. May these examples become clearer to us. We thank you also for the ministration of your angels. May angels attend each one of us. May we come to understand that which we need to know now so that we may more correctly and properly do your will. Help us to this end, Father. Direct us in all things through this day and through this study. For this we thank you and for this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, to briefly recap what we were addressing yesterday, and it came to pass on the seventh day that when they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to possess us or to impoverish us, to take what we have? Is it not so? So even though she was a Philistine, the Philistines looked upon the one that Samson chose as his wife, as an enemy, that she was to be threatened, that she and her family were to be threatened because of this riddle. Now, as we would look at this in the manner in which the translators looked at it, to entice thy husband, we would go back to Judges 16, verse 5, and go forward to 16, 5. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we may give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So in this situation, they are choosing to use a negative. They're threatening Samson's wife where they bribed Delilah. I think this could be easily presented as a chiasm of the Sunday law. Because in bribing Delilah, they're giving an enticement, a, a reason for Delilah to seek to understand where Samson's strength was. And in threatening Samson's wife, they're giving an example of a death decree. Any other thoughts to this? Okay, well, uh, this is kind of interesting in some ways. So we have 
I just want to go back to trying to understand uh, symbolism regarding uh, Samson's wife's uh, parents. Um, so now, so they're going to threaten them, right? Burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Right. Um, so what would this represent? And this came to pass on the seventh day. Right. right. Seventh so, day of the feast. Yeah. So that, that we have this happening. Um, now we know there is this, this riddle that's then going to be, um, that happens at the, that they answer at the end of the seventh day of the feast. Um, so, so they're, they're threatening them. So we have a house being burnt with fire. That's, that's a threat. As they view it, they have to know what's going on because this is something that's hidden to them. Yeah, so I just don't, I'm wondering, trying to figure out who they would represent. I mean, Samson's wife obviously represents this uh, alliance with the false systems of worship. Okay. Then you have this group of people that are going to threaten Samson's wife with the destruction of her father's house with fire. They're still Philistines. Yeah. Yeah, they're still Philistine. Philistines, yeah. So is this just persecution or pressure within, like, the Sunday law? Is this the... It's the way I'm taking it. Yeah. So this would have something to do with the Sunday law. Because we know the way that we understand this. This is pointing to our movement. The seventh day would represent uh, the Sunday law. And we know that symbolically, December 25th, 2021, represented the Sunday law within this movement as a type. So it's what's happened in this movement is typical <coughs> of the Sunday law. And could we say that this movement experienced a Sunday law in this test that was given to it? Because we talked about these tests. Right? The Colin study and then what Stephen found, giving us a choice. Mm hmm Okay. So this riddle, this is, remember we talked about the riddle being um, analogous with Revelation 17. Right? Okay. That is, we would look at the prediction regarding Trump as also connected to this riddle. But we also have the confirmation that Stephen had in recognizing that the Sunday law, the first Sunday law, was 777 years from 457 BC. So that ties in our message to the Sunday law. So everything, and, and we have Colin doing his presentation on December 25th, 2021. So we have a test put before us, which for us is a type of the Sunday law test. We need to be making decisions 
when yeah. we are presented with these tests. Mm -hmm. Because there are those that currently view themselves as proper Adventists that will indeed support the Sunday law. Yes, and, and that, that would exist within our movement as well. Exactly. Now, now part of the thing that, so I'm, I'm going back to when I first became an Adventist and I started to understand about this Sunday law. Now, my perspective as being a non-Adventist was that the Sunday law had to be a lot more than just a simple Saturday, Sunday thing. It's going to manifest itself that way, but the choices and decisions would have to have been made long before because it would be a, a test of character. It's not a test of knowledge, right? Just knowing about the Sunday Sabbath issue isn't going to preserve, preserve someone from receiving the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast wouldn't be some literal mark that we have to avoid. It would have to do with the character, the satanic character that would have to be manifest in our lives. So those that pass the Sunday law test have the character of Christ. Those that fail the Sunday law test have a satanic character, correct? I would agree. Yeah. And that would have, their, their character would be more in line with Satan's than it ever was with Christ's. Right. And, and so we have seen this satanic character being manifested. One is, you know, the amazing thing for me with the 2520 was uh, what I would call the satanic nature of uh, the rejection of the 2520 by people in the church. It was definitely not just a disagreement about some little minor point. It was something, I mean, that was the main thing that convinced me of the truthfulness of the 2520, oddly, was the opposition to the 2520. Because I'd never seen that type of opposition to anything in Adventism before. You, and you understand what I'm talking about. Very much. Anybody who's experienced it. It was just unlike anything. And I, I've seen lots of error, you know, being promoted by different people and the church's react, reaction to it. But I'd never seen anything like this. Uh, I mean, I remember going down to see uh, Kelly in Calgary. And uh, I wanted to have a meeting with uh, the pastor, the associate pastor. And um, anyway, he he didn't want to meet with me. You know, I sent an email. I said I wanted to discuss this because Kelly was being disciplined um, over this issue. And, and Kelly wasn't able to really support all the arguments. So um, but I went down and visited Kelly and and. Uh, uh, the associate pastor actually ended up meeting me in the foyer of the church after church and gave me a dressing down for about an hour. Uh, I ended up being backed into a corner, literally, <laughs> because... I was there. It actually happened. You weren't there. Wasn't I there? No. Yes, I was. I didn't know you yet. This is 2012. Um, I apologize. Please continue. <laughs> anyway, I was back. Yeah, you were there another time, but... But I was backed into a corner because he was so aggressive and my daughters were there and they said he was shaking like he was so angry and I had never seen anything like that. And I was just calm, you know, but as he would cut step closer to me, I would I felt a little bit you know, threatened and ended up into the backing into this corner. So uh, I'd never seen anything like that. And then after he had given me this dressing down. One of the, uh, I guess he was another, he was a, another pastor. He was like a youth pastor or something. Then he gave me a dressing down. I was there for that one. <laughs> you weren't there. It's the same time. It's 2012 before I met you. Okay. You just remembered because I told you about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so when it comes to this whole issue of, of, of character, and what's happened in this movement? I mean, what happened with the declaration? Um, 
and really what has continued to happen. We know that the, the counsel that's been given in the spirit of prophecy has not been followed. And we have tried to follow that counsel the best that we can, considering the circumstances. And we're still willing to, to follow that counsel. But there is a test being put before this movement at the present time, and it's quite a serious test if we are going to take this application that we have here from Judges chapter 14. Okay, <clears throat> two points. Yeah. When we say the counsel of the spirit of prophecy is being set aside, what are we really saying? Well, the spirit of prophecy is being set aside. And it is extremely explicit counsel on what to do when you differ from your brother. When we, when we look at these things in an overall view, mm -hmm. as, as Elder Jeff had done at one point, when he was looking at the two witnesses that would be slayed and their bodies would stay in the street for three and a half days. Mm -hmm. The standard understanding of that prophecy is that the two witnesses were the Old and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But he made a, a very good point that as far as we are concerned right now, the two witnesses are the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm that these were placed on an equivalent level. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are going to set aside the spirit of prophecy, are we also not setting aside the admonitions that we find within scripture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have choices to make here. The corporate church has already stated that it's good to read the spirit of prophecy, but it's not on the same level as scripture. Hmm. Many in the world set aside the spirit of prophecy altogether. Yet our job is not to set aside the spirit of prophecy. It is to use it as additional light with what we find within scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, a comment from the chat. The papacy during the 1260 years threatened those who, who suckered Protestants or anyone they deemed heretics with severe punishment, such as the converse, confiscation of property. They threatened those who left the quote, Mother Church, unquote, with eternal damnation in a fiery hell as late as the 1960s. <clears throat> Yet Rome changes. Rome always changes, right? If we are reading a spirit of prophecy, Rome never changes. Yeah, it may change its public face. Mm -hmm. But it, at the root, it's always the same. So, now, but that's the thing to me when we look at um, the spirit of the papacy. The spirit of the papacy is this spirit that will shut down uh, opposing opinions, misrepresent, persecute, all these types of things. And yet, in this movement, we have done the same thing. And so, if we have the spirit of the papacy, wouldn't we stand on the side? of the Sunday law and oppose right. the Sabbath in the end. So <clears throat> with all of this conversation and discussion regarding Trump, is this a sleight of hand so that we are not considering what could occur with the Pope? Is it possible? Well, that okay, Benedict, go is it possible that Benedict 
could again wind up replacing Francis? Yeah, I don't know about that, but. Well, here again, I'm going back to a presentation that Elder Jeff made in 2020, where that direct question was being broached. Yeah, we don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is that um, when we look at the scriptural evidence and we look at the lines that have been given to us, Trump has already fulfilled his role. It was a typical role in a typical Sunday law, which we call the pandemic. And we didn't know at the time that we were on a typical line that we, we should have known. And I, I knew uh, that it was typical, but the movement didn't. It was really looking for an actual Sunday law. And, but now we know that it, it was a type. And yet, this movement thinks that this typical Sunday law just slides into a real Sunday law when Trump comes back into power, which would be inconsistent with every single thing that we've ever learned. So, so this has to be a test for this movement. Are we going to understand God's word according to Miller's rules? And the rules that that come from Miller's rules by comparing scripture with scripture, or are we going to just live in the realm of speculation, continually speculating about things that we have no scriptural evidence for? And it's a dangerous place to be in because people lose their faith when we continually um, just guess. You know, I, I made a comment to Jeff one time uh, that I wasn't good at um, interpreting some of the symbols in the lines because I don't like to guess at things. That is, I needed to have more solid evidence. So there was a lot of subjective things that people had been saying in, in the movement, and I never liked it. Now, Jeff took that to be that, you know, I, I don't... I'm not good at interpreting symbols at all. But the thing is, if I have something objective and solid, and, and more specifically, as we pass through fulfilled prophecy, then we are given the key to understanding what we experienced. That is something objective. And, and that's something where we don't have to guess. And, and so when it comes to prophecy, I don't believe it's guesswork. I believe it's something that's methodical, and according to the scriptures and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our personal experience and the experience of the movement that helps us to have an assurance about what is coming. And I don't see that in the types of methods of study that are being employed presently. There is no assurance. There's just a simple time will tell. And that's, that's not a prophetic statement. So, so I think we're, we're in a dangerous situation presently in the movement. There are those that have been associated with the movement that are very much like what Mrs. White has written, that they have stepped off the platform and chosen to recommend what they see as improvements. Now, our only safety <clears throat> is to stand on the platform. And as we stand upon the platform, we are accepting that the contractor and builder of this platform is God himself. Anything less for us is dangerous ground. Now that is my statement, that is my opinion. <clears throat> now, 
And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. But he said, un and he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? He's asking her a question. If I am not giving this to my mother and my father, why are you upset? Now, what's really occurring here? I mean, she's, she's trying to say to Samson, you don't love me. You hate me. Why are you marrying? Why are we here? Why am I entering into a covenant with you if you won't trust me? She's questioning everything that's going on. But she's putting extreme pressure upon Samson as she has throughout the wedding feast. She's not happy. She wants this to be in a manner that she is comfortable with because she knows that her family is being threatened. Okay, so I mean, we still haven't fully decided how to understand Samson as a symbol. We know he, he's a type of Christ, but he also represents this movement in the 144,000. And there's this <coughs> relationship that he has with the false method of study. So this false method of study is putting a pressure up upon him to, well, here it, in the story, it's to tell this riddle. But but this but the telling of this riddle would undo the work that Samson was committed to do. And I'm saying that this riddle represents <coughs> a twofold test or a test that two different sides that happened on December 25th, 2021. And so there is a pressure, however we want to understand it, from this type of thinking that affects the movement. That is, I think that what we see this riddle of Revelation 17 that, that Colin's putting forth is it's, it has its, um, it has its pressure. There's an attraction there. So, and, and what is it trying to do? What is what is the reason for this prediction regarding Trump? One thing is it is to try to save face. I think it's more than just one thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I would think, but that that's kind of the reasoning that's been given. We failed, but we didn't fail, and and we know that we didn't fail. But they're trying to give the wrong reason why we didn't fail. I mean, that's the way that I, I have seen it. Um, so may, maybe there's, I mean, obviously there's more to it. But to me, that's part of the motivation. And that would be this uh, pressure that we see here. Uh, she lay sore upon him. I think that's part of the motivation in in this trump prediction for and for people to accept it not just the giving of it for, for people to accept <clears throat> and push it in the direction that they're pushing it well in this in this situation is it possible for samson to represent two separate things can he be representing both the corporate church and the movement? And is it then possible for 
the wife who is a Philistine mm -hmm. and her people to be representing the world, the Christian world that is hearing through this riddle, the prediction of July 18th. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it has to be that way. So <clears throat> there's quite a bit that we're going to be looking at in this, in the balance of this chapter and then in the balance of the next. Mm -hmm. So there's, <clears throat> we're starting to get to the point where we're able to see some clarity to the symbols, but we have not yet fully defined the symbols. Well, well, another thing in, um, so uh, in verse 18, right, it says, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down. So, I mean, to me, when I see that reference to uh, the setting sun, uh, what would that be a reference to? Close of probation. Okay. Well, uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a close of probation. I don't think that's what. If we're going to deal with with our lines, but the sun going down as a symbol has other significances. So see the, the situation in verse 17. Mm -hmm. She wept before him the rest of the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. So he holds out for seven days. Mm -hmm. Almost to the very end of the seventh day before she is able to go back to her people and say, Here's the meaning of the riddle. Yeah, and it's before the sun goes down. So, right. I, mean, I mean, in sense of a close of probation, there's a deadline. But, but I don't think it's representing a close of probation as much as um, just the symbol of the sun going down dealing with chronology, because that's part of the main elements of time. So you have the seventh day and you have the setting sun. But in this situation, Samson had put a deadline. If you reveal this, then I will have to give you 30 shirts and 30 and 30 raiments. Mm -hmm. So he's giving this deadline and they don't want to have to adhere to the deadline. They want, they want Samson to have to produce. They don't want to have to produce. Yeah. So this this deadline to me would represent uh, the time that we had set, right? Because it's the seventh day represents December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, and we had this <clears throat> that happened on December twenty fifth. Didn't we have this um, this confirmation that Stephen had presented, plus also Collins? Uh, study they come both on the same day december 25th 2021 so the the going down of the sun is the end of that line so originally we had this line you know 777 days which we had figured out in um 2018 so we had figured out first november 9th then july 18th and i can't remember exactly it might have been 2019 that we, we, the movement understood the 777 days, ending with December 25th, 2021. I don't remember what date we came up with that, but I know it was Stephen and Odilio working through that. 
So here we had this, this line, and we had connected it to the two Lamex. Um, there's all this study. But it's not until December 25th, 2021, that we now have this new Trump prediction and also Stephen's confirmation with the 777 years. So, so that sun going down becomes a symbol of the chronology and the end of that 777 days. But the answer is given, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. So um, to try to understand this riddle in the context of what we're looking at in this movement, we know that there's the eating of the little book and there is the line of the tribe of Judah and that this is prophecy. So doesn't it make sense that on December 25th, we now have an understanding of prophecy opened up to us, but it's presented in the form of a test. But here is, here is Samson's wife betraying him. Right. And she's committed adultery. In the betrayal? Well, if he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle. So, so that's, that's Samson saying, basically, if you hadn't slept, slept with my wife, you would not have, she wouldn't have told you. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, in this in this situation, she has wept for seven days. Mm -hmm. She then winds up with the answer to the riddle and immediately betrays her husband. Mm -hmm. Because even though this would have meant he would have received 30 shirts and 30 raiment, <clears throat> she doesn't care about that. She cares only that her family is not being threatened. So... I'm just, I, I'm trying to think of additional symbols from this. But I'm not seeing anything yet. Well, we have the seventh day, we have the going down of the sun, we have the symbol of the eating of honey, we have the symbol of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, and and then also this adultery that occurs. So this fornication with the um, with with his wife, his wife. So and and this riddle is is the test, and that that we're faced with presently. But in this, in this situation, if Samson's wife had indeed committed adultery, mm -hmm. by the law that had been given to Moses, she should have been stoned at that point. Well, yeah, but they're not Jews, so. But Samson is. Yeah, but he still, and then he leaves, of course, as we know, but he comes back, she's going to be given to another man. So he still wanted mm -hmm. to have her even in spite of all this. So here, here let's, let's go a little bit forward. Now, Samson, we see here in 1419, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave changes, change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So he's not 
he's not happy with what's happened with his wife. He's not happy with any of the rest of this. And then we see, but Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. So my question here is, in the vernacular that we currently would use, did Samson make a dual mistake? One, in choosing to seek a wife of the Philistines, and two, that the friend that stood with him at the wedding, what we would call the best man, was the one to whom his wife was given by his father-in-law. Yeah, so, which is, is the best man. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so you have the best man who gets the wife. So here he is. <clears throat> choosing to marry a Philistine and choosing as his, his companion a Philistine. And, and we would have to look at these as messages too, right? Agreed. So the Philistines don't represent any particular people in the movement, but they do represent a message and a system of study. The wife particularly. But with the end of our time, we're going to see that the wife, which represents this method of study, is going to be given to the best man, which is a betrayal. And, you know, in this, this movement, if we're going to look at messages that are given, um, you know, we have a true message of righteousness by faith. We have a false. We have a true message of meth medical missionary work. We have a false. We have a true system of studying prophecy and a false. And if we were to look at what's happening in the movement presently, you would see the majority of the people standing on the side of the false. Correct? Right. But yet the false has been given this system of study, right? The companion is a false friend. It's a false message within this movement that has been given Samson's wife. So, so we know However, we want to try to work out the details. We know from this, at least, that that movement, um, that there's the false in this movement and it still exists. And Samson, even though it's his wife, it, there's going to need to be a divorcement, right? Just as we have in Ezra 7.10. 7 to 10, chapter 7 to 10, chapter 10, I guess, specifically, where you have the divorce. And, and so this would lead us to the same conclusions that we've come through in this study, is that we come to a point in this movement where a divorce has to occur from false teaching. Okay. Wasn't this message given to Samson? Okay, explain your question. Well, um, if it's if it's Samson's message, mm -hmm. and she's trying to take it from him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Right, so the, the message of July 18th, we can see that, the, and the message given to Jeff, which let, let's look at it that way. The movement that was given to Jeff, are people trying to take that from, from Jeff? Uh, 
I thought you were talking about the other message of December 25th. Yeah, well, they're all tied together, right? Mm -hmm. So on De that message of December 25th was given to Jeff. But on December 25th, as we passed over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, we were now presented with a new test within this movement, right? Because we've been tested all along in this movement. But we came to the end. We came to the end of all that Jeff had, as far as Jeff had gone. He had gone to December 25th, 2021. That's as far as his predictions went. We had a symbolic Sunday law there. We had the symbols of the Sunday law. We had uh, Ezra um, chapter 10 with the 20th day of the ninth month, because that's the biblical date in December 25th, 2021. But then when that happened, we come to the end of that. Before the sun goes down, we are now presented with the answer to the riddle. But that answer to the riddle has two sides to it. That is, it's going to be used as, uh, as a weapon against Samson. And Samson represents a message in this movement, the message of July 18, 2020. So we still have to understand the 30 um, and, and put that into context. But it would show that what happened um, with this false method message, the false method of study, that we're now faced with the test. And we're going to see this more as we go into uh, chapter 16. Would you say that um, they these here... They, they explained it to see riddle, so they are in a sense they were correct. Mm -hmm. you no, know, would you say then if, if Trump did come back in again, that uh, Colin and whatever they were still, even though they were correct, they were still not on the right side of the issue, even mm -hmm. though they came back in? Yeah, yeah, because the, the issue is not to me whether you know Trump's going to come back in or not. Um, the issue has to do with understanding the lines in the past and the role that Trump played. So if Trump comes back in, if what they're, what they're proposing is that Trump comes back in in order to fulfill the prediction. But if Trump comes back in, that means they didn't accept the understanding of Trump that's already been revealed. It, it, it's it's a, a prediction that, that is a rejection of July 18, 2020. It's a rejection of, of the lines. Um, now, I don't think Trump's going to come back in, but that, that to me is not even really the issue. The issue is how are we studying the Bible and how are we treating each other in our differences of opinion? Because there's no way they're going to allow me uh, to present what I think about uh, these passages that Colin's been presenting. There's no way I can go on their study and, and share anything. And that's been shown already. So, and I'm not going to go and push the issue. I'm not going to go and create a, a, a controversy again. I'm going to respect the fact that they don't want me to share anything. But the thing is, they don't. And that is wrong. Even if, even if I was wrong, what they're doing is wrong. And we have looked at what Colin has had to say, and, and we've done it fairly. And I still think that Colin has light there. I think there's light on what he's shown, but the light does not the Trump becoming president again. And Adilio, same thing, the chronology that Adilio has, it supports what we already understand. It doesn't say, it doesn't support the idea that Trump has to become president again. Now, if Trump did become president again, it would embolden many people in the decisions that they've made. But the decisions they've made are wrong, even if Trump became president again. And they would be, they're, they're, would be misled. But we also know that the line that brings us to the end of 
Collins study, that is, um, <clears throat> the, the line between January 11th, 2023 and January 12th, 2023, that line, that midnight, whatever the, the division is of that day, connects us to April 5th, 2030. So, so we've spent some time in, in other studies looking at this, and we can see that, that this lines up with the story of Ezra 7 to 10, that is the one year period from the first day of the first month in 457 BC to the first day of the first month in 456 BC. We, we really need to understand what that means because that year we have this divorcement and, and no one is, is on the other side is interested in looking at this. And this is so fundamental, uh, what we see in 457 BC to Adventism, but also to this movement and to see that, you know, it doesn't end on October 22nd, 1844, on the 10th day of the seventh month. It ends on the first day of the first month. And that lines up month for month, day for day. 2,300 months from October 22nd, 1844 to April 5th, 2030. It, it's just too profound a, a connection to just dismiss. And yet it's being not just dismissed. It's not even, nobody's even really willing to look at it. And so you can't make the Trump prediction without understanding that whole context. Now, uh, another thing, um, when we look at um, this mirror, so here, I'm just going to bring this up because I think this is an important point. Um, so I just have to open up my PowerPoint here. Okay, so this was what we were talking about here. We had shown this the other day. This is the Collins... Uh, Prediction. It's 800 days from November 3rd, 2020 to January 11th, 12th, 2023. And, and then we're going to have these, this divorcement happening. But uh, I'm going to bring up this other diagram. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, now, back in 2017, when I was... Um, First, because it was in 2016, late 2016, when we found uh, this structure in the story of Ezra. And uh, this structure here, I have to bring it up. I know the, the picture I have is going to be pretty busy. Uh, man, I got a lot of slides. Um, I've made a lot of slides since 2017. Okay. So, here, I'll find it this way. Um, I know I have to switch through a lot of things. Okay, so it's going to be here right away. Oh, here's what I want. Uh, this is... Okay, we have these... Um, this is in the story of Ezra. Ezra arrives at Jerusalem. This is going to be the fifth the first day of the fifth month and you're going to have this center of this is the tenth day of the seventh month right so if we go from um the 20th day of the ninth month over here you're going to see there's 69 days symbolically it's 70 days 
and the tenth day of the seventh month is the center. Now, what's the center of this structure between the tenth day of the seventh month and the twentieth day of the ninth month? Fifteenth day of the eighth month. So it's the fifteenth day of the eighth month. So we have another chiasm between this. And the fifteenth day of the eighth month is August fifteenth. Yeah, well, yeah, it's August 15th, but it's Jeroboam offering up his offering in um, Bethel, right? When the prophecy of the 300, uh, well, the prophecy of, of Josiah is given, right? From which the 390 days are going to be counted or 390 years. Yeah. Now, so in this movement, July 18th, is it? Is it analogous with the 10th day of the seventh month? Is it a parallel to that? In our disappointment. Yes, you have uh, and a sort of a, to the movement anyway, it's a, a parallel. Not in the big line. No, I know. But yeah, so it, it's it's a typical parallel. But we know that the July 18th at 187 is the symbol. And the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year on the biblical calendar. Right. And then we have this 20th day of the ninth month. Now, now what is Ezra doing in this whole period when he gets to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month? all the way to the 20th day of the ninth month. What's Ezra doing? Well, he gets to hear about the uh, the mixed marriages going on. Okay. And he, he's astonished. He's amazed at what's going on. And he's crying out in a sense in his heart. Mm -hmm. And then people join with him in this year that uh, something's to be done about this. Yeah, and, and this is going to be a period of four months, roughly, a bit less than four months. So he's, he's going to be setting up the, the administration, the, the civil administration in Jerusalem, which, which is the authority that was given in Artaxerxes' decree. Right, to set up magistrates and judges and to be able to mete out punishments, e even up to the death penalty. So he's been given this civil authority and he's setting this up. Now, the center of this is the 10th day of the seventh month. But we know that it's on the 20th day of the ninth month that he enacts it. That is, this is the record of him issuing this decree. It's actually three days before that he issues this call to Jerusalem uh, to repent. And then when they come and repent, he's going to set up a legal proceeding to deal with these divorcements according to the law, right? They're not just going to get rid of their wives. These wives have to be taken care of, etc. cetera. So, so we have this symbol of the midnight cry. But it's, it's, it's a symbol that, that has lots of connections. You know, it's when Ezekiel begins to lie on his right side, it's going to be on August 15th. Um, so, so we have all these connections connecting Ezekiel, the story of Ezra, um, the story of Jeroboam. Now, if we're going to look at this because we know the divorcements are going to begin on the first day of the 10th month and continue for three months, the 10th, 11th, and 12th month, and end on the first day of the first month. But this, this 15th day of the eighth month, what would it represent that has happened in our movement?
I'm not tracking this exactly. Okay, so like false priests or like a false false worship. Okay, so we have a false worship. So a, a false midnight cry. And the false always precedes the true. Right. So now, uh, from July 18, 2020, this movement began to study. E even before that, I mean, we began back in uh, um, March 27th, really, uh, 2020, to study. Um, so we ha so we had this beginning of this study to to understand what July 18th was about. We had the pandemic begin, so we could actually, I mean, I wasn't working, so I had lots of time to present long studies, three hour studies, um, and going over everything and up to July 18th. And then eventually we, we settled down to an hour and a half in the morning, but we were studying because we wanted to understand July 18th and July 18th passed we had the keys to understand our disappointment. But we also had within the movement um, other issues that arose. So we had, of course, December 6, 2020 declaration, which was a rejection of this message, rejection of everything that Jeff had done. So the so the question is, are we are we how are we connected to the division that happened with ancient Israel in 977 BC? Is there any connection that we can bring to this to what happened in our history? Because Jeff already had made an application of it to Parminder, right? Correct. Right with the September seventh. Uh, presentation that he did, the date of that. And then he went back and he would address how this represented a Parminder's movement. But is Parminder's movement still continuing in this movement? Elements of it are. Yeah, the basic premises, the, the basic arguments are still being presented. maybe from a different perspective in some ways, like different conclusions are drawn, but still the same basic ideas exist. Okay, any, any other thoughts on this? of this uh, 15th day of the eighth month and, and what we see in the story of Ezra. So we came to the 20th day of the ninth month, but remember we had the declaration in um, 2020, right? Correct. And, and that declaration was an affirmation of the arguments that Parminder had used against July 18th. Now, in the story of in the story of Ezra, in that one year period, we have lined up each day for a month. Okay, but in this story with Ezra, yeah, we're talking about the twentieth day of the ninth month, and then we're talking about the first day of the tenth month. Correct. Um, yep, the first day of the 10th month. So we, we would say that the first day of the 10th month is uh, January 12th, 2023. Okay, but I'm, I was intrigued with a lot of this. And last evening, I went into first Esdras, which okay. is, if I understand it correctly, Ezra and Nehemiah combined in the Greek versions of, of the Bible. And there are additional days that are stated 
mm -hmm. in First Esdras. Okay. Do we make application of those additional days within this line? Well, well I think we have to. Now, is there any particular date that you wanted to look at? Well, okay. After we're dealing with the first day of the 10th month, um, I'm going to read these and I, I'm preparing this to be able to send this out so that we can all look at it, which we may want to do on Sunday. Okay. So first Esdras 9.16. And Esdras the priest chose unto him the principal men of their families all by name. And in the first day of the 10th month, they started to examine the matter. The subsequent verse, 917. So their cause that held strange wives was brought to an end in the first day of the first month. Yeah. And of the priest that were come together and that had strange wives there were found and they give a list of those those priests and they gave their hands to put away their wives and to offer a ram to make reconciliation for their errors So now it goes through the Levites, the holy singers, the porters, different members of those that had come out of the captivity. So then by the time we get further down, we come to 1st Esdras 9:37. Now, in 936, it reads, all these had taken strange wives, and they put them away with their children, and the priests and the Levites, and they that were of Israel, dwelt in Jerusalem and in the country in the first day of the seventh month, so the children of Israel were in their habitations. Now, the first day of the seventh month is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. Prior to the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. And the whole multitude came together with one accord into the broad place of the holy porch toward the east. Now, this is, um, so I'm trying to figure this out. So the context here. Um, Okay, I'm just reading over this here. So you're going to have this, right? So you're going to have what happens in Ezra chapter 9, the two or three days, it says here. It says two or three. Um, the th and in three days were all, were all they of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin gathered together, the 20th day of the ninth month. So you're going to have that 20th day of the ninth month. And now you're going to have like nearly a year later. So, right. so, so a year later, they're going to make these offerings on the first day of the seventh month. It's either going to be 10 or 11 months later. Yes. Yeah, it's 10 months later. Well, I, I said either because yeah. do we have a way of knowing if this was a, a leap? Going, yeah. going to be one of those years that was a leap year. Yeah, it's, it's not a leap year. Okay. It's a regular year. So, um, yeah, so 10 months later, they're going to have this uh, offering. So we don't get that in, in, in the biblical uh, Ezra. But, we do get it here. but yeah. do we get it in the biblical Nehemiah? Well, in Nehemiah, yeah. So, yeah, so but Nehemiah, what you're dealing with is something that's going to be 13 years later. But it's a parallel to this event. Okay. 
Because no, Nehemiah is going to be in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, not in the, well, this would actually be in the eighth year of Artaxerxes. So in this, in this situation where we have this 10 month period, 10 being a symbol of a test, mm -hmm. as, as we're looking, or as I'm looking at this and reading it, and they spoke unto Esdras, the priest and reader, that he would bring the law of Moses that was given of the Lord God of Israel. So Esdras, the chief priest, brought the law unto the whole multitude from man to woman and to all the priests to hear the law in the first day of the seventh month. And he read in the broad court before the holy porch from morning unto midday before the before both men and women, and the multitude gave heed unto the law. So, at the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, Ezra is giving the law. He's, he's reiterating the law. And they are under this test after 10 months. Are you going to accept the law or are you going to put it aside? So if we're looking at this and we're taking these three days as three months, mm -hmm. how are we to look at this that is occurring in this in this passage on the first day of the seventh month I mean, this is, this is heavily symbolic. But it's also interesting that this entire study that we're dealing in this with Samson ties us right back to this situation with Ezra. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so the point that, that, that we can make is we know that in this movement, we have, um, we have this prediction regarding Trump, and we know that that is part of a chronology that we can establish, that is, that, that's, that prediction is connected chronologically to our lines. But it's also connected to the story of Ezra with the, from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. And that ties us to August, or not to August, April 5th, 2030. Okay. And now we don't know what that means as far as a date in the future, but we can definitely see that it, it's connected However, we want to understand that because we're not making any prediction about what's going to happen in the future. But we know it's it's symbolically represented in the story of Ezra and that the divorcement has to take place. So right. that means we are married to strange wives and we do need that divorcement from the strange wives. But prior to the first day of the 10th month, so we can't be at the first day of the 10th month yet because that doesn't start till January 12th, 2023. So we're in that period of 10 days since December uh, 25th, 2021. So we're in this time of testing and we're being tested with a message that was given on December 25th, 2021. Basically two men's messages were presented to us and we're being asked to choose. Now there was a comment in the chat. A 
basically it's talking that the false midnight cry is connected with 158, with that being August 15th scrambled. Well, it's not that scrambled, the 15th day of the eighth month. Right. So, so we already recognize that, um, that league. The league and the compromise that's made to have the league between the Romans and the Jews. Yeah. And, and I see this, this Trump prediction and as, as a league. Yes. To me, it's a league with the Protestants. Would it be a league with the Protestants or would it be more of a league with the corporate church that has already sought the league with the Protestants? Well, I think it's both. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's both. It's so when we looked at what Colin was presenting, one is we could see that there's a great deal of light in it. There are things that are correct. The only problem is the, con the conclusion doesn't logically follow from the information that we have. Same with Odilio's study. It's correct, except the conclusion doesn't follow. Now, the question is, why does that conclusion come at all? Well, it's because we don't understand the past. When we reject the past, we can't understand the, the present or the future. And, and that neglect of our past history is the biggest problem that we have in the movement today. We don't understand what happened. We don't understand Millerite history. We don't understand our own history. So how can we know what's going to happen? If we're not willing to study this history, we're not going to find the way marks of the history. Right? Right. So, so we're, we're, we're sort of walking in the dark. I mean, if we reject the light of the midnight cry, there's no light for our feet, and we'll walk off the path and fall into the dark, wicked world below. Right? Exactly. So... Why is there this neglect of understanding our history? And, and I think part of it is when we understand the history of the past, it exposes us because it sheds light upon us, upon our characters. And so it's much easier to just reject the past and to look hopefully to the future with these blind predictions. No disagreement on my part. I think we have we have to examine the history in depth in order for us to understand where we are currently. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point that you're trying to make. Yeah. And in chapter 14 here. Um, so when the wife of Samson was given to one of his friends with whom he was, well, let me see, I'm looking at a strange translation because I was looking at uh, um, Ezra's. So when Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. So uh, who is the best man in this case of, you know, that Samson had chosen? We know that he was a Philistine. Yeah, but yeah, he's a Philistine. But what ends up happening to people who leave this movement? They either become reunited with the corporate church or they leave everything altogether. Yeah, so wouldn't this best man be the church? Very possibly. That, that, 
the movement has made a mistake in its alliance, one with this system of study, but this, this system of study has had relations with the best man, and the best man must be the church. As a, as a symbol, I think we could we can tentatively place the best man as as being the church, but that would mean that the best man in representing the church must have some other representation as well, because we've often accepted that the woman is the church. Yes, but this would be the. Um, because the, the, the wife here, I mean, usually a woman represents a church, but we're saying that this is a strange wife. Right. Right. So this is a false method of study, because that's how we've understood that. And, and the church is going to be married to this, because the church is acting as the bridegroom. No, the church is or, or the best man, pardon me. Well, he's going to marry the wife, though. Right. So he's going to be the bridegroom. He's going he's going to take the position of the bridegroom. Right. Which isn't his rightful place. Right. Right. So so he's the best man, but he becomes the bridegroom. So Samson, this this message has has made an alliance with false system of study. And and also has had a connection to the church, seeing the church as the best man. But the best man, the church, is just going to take his wife. And, and we would have to say that, um, that it, it was probably the best man that plowed with the heifer, with Samson's heifer. Because that would be why she ended up, you know, one of, I mean, obviously we know she's under threat and so forth, but she has relations with the best man. And, and we would assume that it was before, not just after. That's why he would be given, she would okay. be given to him. But the, the, initial, the initial purpose for the best man is that if, if the bridegroom cannot carry forward with his commitment, that the best man would step in to carry forward with the commitment. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have the bride believing that her intended husband does not love her and weeping sore upon him for seven days. As we are told in the next chapter, the father-in-law then sees that Samson is not happy with his wife and gives her then to the best man. And we're going to need to, to address this in, in a lot more detail. Now, we have about six minutes remaining of our study today. Do we go into the portion from the spirit of prophecy or do we wait and do this on Sunday and cover additional symbols at that point as well? Yeah, we could probably go into this on Sunday. Okay. Now, do we have any other thoughts or questions or comments with what we've been covering today. So everybody tracks with this. That's that's interesting. Well, I just uh, I, I do think that your voice should be heard. With the other group, I think that's, that's wrong, but I think Colin's method, what he was doing was just line upon line. He was bringing Daniel 2, Daniel 3, verses 
Daniel 11 verses 2 to, was it 2, 3 or in there as well together with Revelation chapter 17 I think it was just a general line upon line there was a, a re, I think it was a reasonable study to yeah. present I would agree you know, yeah. Um, so, to, to so that, so I, do, I believe I believe that they should still be considering other things and to look into it. You know, it still has some problems with it, some flaws. I think uh, things that need to be ironed out. But I think it's uh, to me it was like a line upon line. He, he went through William Mother's rules and stuff prior to that as well. And you know, go ahead, go ahead. What are you saying? Yeah, so so I would agree with you. So the idea of what he initially did was not wrong. The problem was there were some details or questions that needed to be answered, and nobody wanted to answer those questions. And, and that was basically the simple thing was, if we are to understand a prophecy, um, an application, we have to look at the original application of that prophecy. And, and that had to do with who was Alexander the Great. How, how did we line him up? And we know that Jeff originally had lined him up with, with Trump. But he had lined him up with Trump in a very particular way. That is, Trump was going to become the head of the UN. And what we saw is that the United States was conquered by the globalists on January 6th. Uh, 2021. So, so we had to look at this in a different way. Um, then also we had with Revelation 17 itself, the unwillingness to examine what the pioneers understood and to look in detail at Revelation 12, 13, and 17. So once you ignore you can use line upon line, and that's correct, but you have to bring all the lines together. You can't pick and choose what lines you want, and you can't ignore their fulfillments in the past. And so there's nothing wrong with call and study. It needed to be studied. The, the main problem was is that it was they were, they were unwilling to examine any arguments to get against it. And, and it was just against the conclusion. It wasn't against what Colin was doing. So that, that was part of the problem, is he was using Miller's rules in part, but not all of them. We, we have to bring every line together. So I still don't understand why you bring the Greek into it when it's all Persia. Yeah, well, that was the question. Why would we? Why would we bring Greece as part of the United States? The only way that that can happen is if the United States is conquered by Greece, which is what happened to Persia. So you can't have the United States be Greece, except in the sense that it's conquered. So, so yeah, we have all of these questions. What we should have done on December 25th is we should have, as a movement, taken what Colin had presented and studied it together. That's what we should have done. But instead, it was made into an us and them. And that never should have happened. That's, that's my view. Now, things happened even prior to December 25th, 2021, which is why people didn't want to hear me. But the things that I had had talked about were things that were valid, um, valid points. So, so obviously things had developed to the point where uh, people weren't willing to listen to what I had to say. But that was based upon a rejection of the counsel of this in the spirit of prophecy. So, so we're in this situation, but we're in this situation because of our characters. 
And so we have to figure out how to get out of this situation. We have to figure out what it is God wants us to do. But I, I still think that we need to study this out. And I mean, that's what I tried to do. I invited Colin to present studies. He didn't. But I would have much rather Colin presented his studies and we studied them out than me having to present Colin's studies. I did the best that I could. And he agreed that I didn't misrepresent what he said. So, you know, I think we're, we're looking at this fairly. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? Shall we then close with prayer and take this back up on Sunday? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for this time that we have spent in study and in considering the words of your scripture and that which has been before us. Guide us today. Direct us in the path where we should walk. Help us, Father, so that we may leave our hand in yours, so that in all things that, are, that is done, your character may be properly represented to all with which we come in contact. Direct us to this end. Be with us now. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.